So welcome to our uh, final uh, seminar of the quarter. And uh, we're, we're lucky to have uh, uh, yet another distinguished speaker with us this afternoon. Um, so we have uh, Dr. Sui Kai Lu here visiting from Austria. Uh, and uh, just give you a, a few words of background. Um, so Dr. Liu has his, uh, his graduate training all from, uh, from Austria. And I'll get the institution uh, correct here. Uh, University of Technology in, in Vienna, Austria. He has graduate degrees in, in civil engineering and also in rational mechanics. Uh, um, as part of his, uh, his graduate work, he, uh, being an Austrian, he, his uh, he had colleagues there that were uh, friends with our Professor Kalwinkler here. And uh, uh, during his graduate time, he, he came here and worked with uh, Professor Kermidjian uh, first, and then kind of throughout his uh, research career beyond his degree, he's, he's continued working with Professor Kalwinkler on a variety of uh, 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 several projects. Um, so, so he has roots uh, back to Bloom Center uh, uh, 10 or, so, 10 or so years ago, and has been in touch with our faculty members uh, since then, and we're fortunate that we could get him back in the country to, uh, to give a seminar of what he's up to. Um, so his work, as you can see from the title of his talk, uh, relates to masonry structures, which isn't something that we're going to get a lot of uh, exposure to here um, in your coursework and things, and so it's, it's uh, exciting that we can hear a, uh, an update of um, uh, things that are going on in the world with masonry structures and <laughs> seismic design. Um, Wienerberger, where uh, Dr. Liu works, is, uh, I believe, the world's largest mm -hmm. um, kind of manufacturer mm -hmm. or, or, uh, of, of masonry materials and, and, and kind of a world-renowned leader in, in, in masonry materials and, and, and use of masonry in seismic regions. So uh, we went straight to the, to the top for a, um, an update of kind of what's going on in the world of, of analysis and experimentation and, and uh, characterizing these materials for use in seismic zones. So we're very excited to have you here this afternoon. And, uh, thanks Thank you very much, Jake. It was a very warm welcome from my side. I'm happy to be here after 10 years, as he said. Time is passing by very fast. I even can't uh, imagine that it was 10 years, but however. Uh, today we are talking about masonry. As he said, Wienerberger is the world's largest masonry produ producer and manufacturer. We are also based in the US. We call General Shale here if you want to uh, check on web. So we will speak about masonry, about general masonry, how to do masonry, some static analysis, dynamic analysis, tests, uh, in situ test and also laboratory test. So if we talk about masonry, sorry about that. So if you talk about masonry, uh, that's the general picture most of you have of a masonry structure where the bricks, or as we call it in a modern way, blocks, are nowadays not at a small size. Anyhow, we have uh, in the masonry so-called so uh, the blocks, which can be uh, horizontal and vertical perforated. Uh, in this case, the white pattern gives you the thermal properties which you need for some countries. Uh, and also we're talking about head joints. Head joints can be fully filled with mortar, normally one centimeter, or in some regions, so-called mortar pockets. That means you just feel a little bit of the head joint or with the modern, uh, with the mo modern way in tongue and groove. So tongue and groove is no mortar at all. This is due to the higher, higher thermal insulation. Uh, from the bed joint point of view, as you know, probably the normal bed joint. Bed joint, we have different mortars. Either we use the normal mortar uh, calcium cement, M5. Five means five megapascal in strength. Or you have the thermal insulation mortar. So you have M5, M10, M15, up to M25 in megapascal. This gives the strength, compressive strength of the bed joints. Or as I said, thermal insulation mortar. Uh, the more modern way is to use the so-called thin bed mortar. Thin bit mortar is just one millimeter or even less than one millimeter. It's like a glue, therefore the blocks need to be grinded. So the accuracy of the blocks are more or less 0.5 millimeter. And uh, the newest invention is a glue based on polyurethane. So it's no mortar at all, no cement at all. You just apply two lines of this glue and put these blocks together. So we talked about bed joints and head joints. And also from uh, the material point of view, 
the most natural way is the natural stone, as also defined in Eurocode 8. <coughs> natural stone, as you find granite or whatever. Uh, then we have concrete blocks. On the other hand side, uh, calcium silicate blocks, which are also here in the US from Sika or AAC, also from the same brand. Uh, also aerated concrete or clay blocks. Clay blocks with a white pattern. As I said, the white pattern is for the thermal insulation. So we have unreinforced masonry, bearing masonry, where you don't need any reinforcement, you don't need anything to keep it bearing, or you have so-called confined masonry. In this case, you have the confinements. So say, if you can see the vertical and the horizontal confinements to somehow bait the masonry. Keep in mind that the confined mason, in confined masonry, the masonry itself is bearing. So it's a bearing masonry. We just need the confinement to use it as a belt. I will come to it later on. The confinement should be done at every window, at every opening. There are some rules given in different codes where, in what space, and what distance you need the so-called vertical and horizontal confinements. Uh, in developing countries, like uh, there are somewhere, in, somewhere probably in, in South America or in Eastern Europe, uh, they use just a wooden uh, plate to put it to the corner and pull concrete into it. So then the joints looks at this, that you have really the concrete filled into the masonry parts or into the block parts. Or the more modern way is to use uh, predefined blocks where you can have your channel, your vertical confinement channel directly in the block itself. And now coming also to infill masonry. The difference between infill masonry and bearing masonry is, uh, and, 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 and confined masonry is that in infill masonry, the masonry itself is not bearing, it's just an infillment. So in order to build the confined masonry, you pull the concrete together with uh, the slab when you make the concrete of the slab. For infill masonry, you make the reinforced concrete frame, and at the end, you just fill it up. So it's not a bearing material at all, it just brings you mass and also no stiffness. Uh, from the analysis part, talking about vertical strength, how to test the vertical strength, you just put five blocks or five rows to each other and press it up. So this is called a relay body. Uh, in order to test the vertical strength of a masonry wallet, in order to make the vertical design, you need some buckling factors to the FK. So the vertical strength is depending on FB, the block strength, and on FM, the strength of the mortar. It's a combination of block and mortar in order to define the vertical strength of a wallet without buckling, actually. Decay and the power to alpha and power to beta just are some indicators given in some rules or codes for different kinds of masonry in sense of material or different white patterns. If we have thin bed mortar, as I said before, the grinded blocks, uh, you don't need the part of FM because the mortar doesn't play a role at all. You just have FB with some other exponentials of alpha and some other Ks. Uh, shear strength. The first shear strength model was developed by Hendry and uh, Schinha in '69. So you have on the vertical axis your sigma, on the horizontal axis your tau. Uh, so, so vertical tau, horizontal your sigma. It is, as you can see, more or like, uh, more or less like a more Coulomb model. So you have an initial strength, initial strength, and then more or less a line, the same like a more Coulomb model for friction actually. <clears throat> the more developed model is from Mann Müller from 73. This model was also implemented into the DIN, into the German codes, and finally in implemented into the new Eurocode 6, which is the code for masonry in Europe. Uh, he defined five different uh, uh, failure mechanisms. So you have embed joint, sliding embed joint, uh, tensile failure, compressive failure, and uh, the opening of the bed joints, because in masonry, in unreinforced masonry, you're saying that the mortar cannot take over any tensile strength. So it's the same like you make the analysis of uh, footing of uh, structure, it opens actually just at the, at the button. And Mann Müller also said, this was the new thing, 
that in the head joints no shear strength will be transmitted. So the whole shear strength must be transmitted on the bed joints. Therefore, the block you can see here, the stress block, goes over from the bed joints from one block to another block. Why he invented this model? Because the new masonry, the modern masonry now they use, are mostly done with Tongan groove, as I said before, without mortar, so unfilled, uh, unfilled head joints. And therefore, we need a model in order to transfer the shear strength from one block to another block. Uh, I've made a model in 2006, and a three-dimensional model, which is based on the model of Gantz uh, in Switzerland, uh, and have uh, extended the three-dimensional uh, failure mechanism with some tensile failures, so with five failure criteria also. Uh, tension failure in block or brick, uh, compressive failure in brick, shear failure in brick, sliding along the bed joints. Sliding along the bed joints is the same like before, a more Coulomb model actually, and tension failure in bed joint. And this is the model in the code, in Eurocode, which is just on more Coulomb, but also, as I said, based on uh, Mann Müller, where you have the initial strength, initial shear strength, uh, the tangent alpha, uh, and also an FBLT. So it says nothing else that without any compression, you have an initial shear strength. Then, as more compression you have, the more shear strength you get. And, oops, sorry. As more compressor you have, as more shear strength you have, and it will end with the failure in the block, which is the FLT here. And finally, compression failure. So FVK, the characteristic shear strength, is defined as FVKO, initial shear, shear strength, plus 0.4, which is tangent alpha, which is somewhere around 39 degrees in the uh, sliding angle times sigma, sigma is the compressive strength or compressive stress which comes from the top. And as I said before, in masonry, in unreinforced masonry, the bed joints does not transmit any tension strength. So if you have tension, as you can see it here, the joint, the model of the joint is opened and therefore you need to only take the LC, the compressive area, the compressive length, which is this in, this in this picture, in order to transmit your shear strength. So this is the big problem in masonry. You need some compressive uh, stress in order to transmit shear strength. And the solution invented was the uh, confined masonry, whereas with the belt, as I showed before, in confined masonry, you can use the full length of the wall. So you don't need the compressive area in confined masonry. And out of plane is just defined by out of plane parallel to the bed joints and out of plane uh, perpendicular or orthogonal to the bed joints with some numbers. This is just copy paste from the code, as I said, with the materials from before clay, calcium silicate, uh, autoclaved, aerated concrete, AAC, and some stones. So here you have the mortar classes. The code in, in Europe is generally written in the same way. So you have the materials of the, of the blocks and the mortar, as I said, the compressive strength of mortar, which is either smaller than five or bigger than five, and somewhere at um, 25. The thin layered mortar, this is the grinded blocks, or the thin layer glue, and lightweight mortar. Lightweight mortar is the same like thermal insulation mortar with a better lambda in order to reduce the thermal, or to increase the thermal insulation. Uh, earthquake analysis, so now we have defined the materials, we have seen what joints you have in bed joints and in, in, in head joints, uh, in head joints. you have seen how to make the statical analysis, vertical, shear with the different kinds of masonry, either confined masonry or unreinforced masonry, or for infill masonry don't make the analysis at all because for infill masonry you make the analysis for the RCU frame. Uh, now, coming to the earthquake uh, analysis, there are a couple of ways to design um, masonry. The most easiest way is the so-called Model C. Model C is given in Europe and also, I believe, in the States, uh, where you don't design it at all. Actually, you have some tables, you have some general rules where uh, how you have to define your, 
your joints, how you have to define some, some details and so on. And generally you just have to fulfill uh, the shear wall areas for each direction. This is the easiest model or the easiest way to design or if you, if you can call it design, to, to, to approximate, to evaluate how much shear walls you need. But it is allowed under certain circumstances according to Eurocode. So as you see, you have unre uh, unreinforced masonry, confined masonry and reinforced masonry. Uh, for, for example, the different PJs at the top where you need, if you, if you have unreinforced masonry, you have a PJ of 0.1 times K mal G. Uh, two percent for each direction it means two percent of the of the floor area you need as shear walls into one direction in order to fulfill this earthquake <coughs> advantages uh, it is comfortable and easy it is fast without any numerical analysis and it is also usable for let me say non-engineers because in some countries in Europe you don't need to be an engineer to design small structures so you don't have to need an degree or something. So exactly what these people, this is this section of the code was done. Uh, disadvantage is a very conservative method, which is clear. It gives you limitations in strength and story numbers. The slide before you can see, here you have also the story numbers you want to have. If you want to go above these story numbers, it's not allowed to use this table anymore. Or if you want to go above these PJs, in this case it's not allowed to use it anymore. <clears throat> or if you have less than these shear walls in your structure. And as I said, yeah, limitations in the PGA. Uh, the next more sophisticated method is nothing else than the simplified response spectrum method. Uh, in the simplified response spectrum method, you just consider the first node. So you take it as a uh, single degree of freedom system uh, with uh, the force, with a horizontal force, is a force-based method with the response times the mass and times some uh, factors given in the code. So you assume the full structure as a one degree of freedom system. Uh, the advantages of this model is it is easy and comfortable to use because it is still handleable. You don't need some sophisticated software in order to use this. Uh, and it is understandable for every designer, for every engineer. The disadvantage is also still a conservative method. Uh, bearing reserves are just given in the so-called Q value. Behavior factor uh, in the US is called R value in the codes here. So it's the only value where you can include your nonlinear uh, behaviors. And it is mostly, if an engineer is using this, he's not evaluating the first frequency, he's always going to the plateau actually. So therefore also it is very conservative. The response spectrum method, it's clear you include higher modes until you reach 90% of the effective masses. Uh, advantages, you have a high accuracy compared to simplified or compared to the single degree of freedom system uh, since you use the higher mode uh, influences. It is more sophisticated, you need a software in this case and uh, it is also only limited, uh, it is also limited by the R values or Q values, the so-called behavior factors. And also pushover analysis, uh, which you push your structure until nonlinearity. So you take a an, an mode shaped a load pattern, horizontal mode pattern, which is a triangle, for example, and uniform. In the Eurocode, it says you need to do both uniform load and also triangle mode. Uh, push it until nonlinearity to get the capacity curve. Uh, take the tree plot of your response spectra. Take the axis you need, S, A, and S, D, so you transform the response spectra, transform the capacity curve to a single degree of freedom system, uh, and then either you have your dominant uh, uh, period above T, C, T, C is an edged period which is given in the code depending on your soil, then you use the principle of the same uh, displacements, that means you enlarge the elastic part until you have a cross section with the response spectra and go it and put it down until you find a point. If you find a point, you're happy, the design is done. Actually, in your code it says you still need 1.5 reserve from this point in order to be on the safe side. 
This is actually depending on the countries. In Italy, for example, you don't need to save that oil, so you just need to find the wine and you're happy. In Eurocode, you need to have a 1.5 factor. Or if your frequency or if your dominant period is smaller than TC, so for very soft structures, uh, you use the principle of the same energies, of the same errors of the energies. So it's also you enlarge the elastic part of your bilinearized uh, capacity curve until you have a cross section and then goes down with these equations. If you find a point, the same like before, you're happy, then you, the analysis is done and you still need 1.5 for a safety factor. Yeah, I did mention that these, uh, the, the vertical and the horizontal axis is also transformed from the tree plot of the response spectra. This is a very realistic model. Uh, it is also this is based on the N2 method of Professor Pfeiffer, which is also implemented into the Eurocode. And uh, analysis is still possible, so you can still do some analysis when you went to the edge with the other methods described before. So this is somehow more complex, and it is not usable without any software, because it's very hard to do it by hand, and you need a material model. But the easiest way to do a material model in this case is just a bilinear material model, so which is also given in the codes. You go up with some um, elastic part and then with the horizontal plastic part where the epsilons or where the ultimate drifts are given in codes and also when it goes from elastic to plastic, which is nothing else than the strength, either shear or bending strength. If we sum up the models for masonry, because for masonry, for bearing masonry, either unreinforced masonry or confined masonry, we're mainly talking about um, three to five story numbers. So it's not a high rise building normally. It's not a 100 story or whatever building. So in this case, for masonry, the method C is very simple to do. Uh, the output, the effectivity is also very less. If you investigate some more work and use the simple uh, the simplified response spectrum method, as I said, with just uh, one degree of freedom. You get lots out of it because it is mostly not necessary to do the response spectrum method because you cover more or less 90% of the mass in the first node because we're talking just about three to five stories. So just give an imagination of the natural frequencies. Normally, we are lying between three to six hertz. So it is very, very stiff structure, but we will go to it later on. Pushover method gives you the best results for sure. You need to put in some more effort in order to get the pushover, and uh, you get really most, uh, most out of it. Time history, nonlinear time history analysis is unnecessary, or not really necessary for design. It's more for research if you want to recalculate some tests or so on. Uh, just some advertisement, we have made a software together with Chairwinkel where we have used the equivalent frame method to simulate unreinforced masonry, confined masonry. Uh, it, it simulates the masonry wallets into uh, equivalent frame and gives you a pushover analysis out of it where you have the capacity curves and see if you're happy or not, either you reach a point or not. As described before, according to Eurocode 8 or the N2 method from Professor Pfeiffer. So this is more or less the earthquake analysis, what is nowadays used in the world uh, for masonry. In order to get some input values for your analysis, you need to have the values out of tests. In the codes, you have uh, most of the values already defined, but if you invent some new materials or if you have some new white patterns or new mortars or whatever, you need to do the tests. And here uh, are some kinds how to do the tests. So for shear strength, in order to evaluate the shear strength of a masonry, you put three blocks together and try to push the middle block out of it. So if you apply a force, a horizontal force left and right, you can simulate the sigma, the vertical force actually. In this case, it is horizontal, but you can simulate the vertical loadings actually and try to push out the middle block. In this case, you get one point of the more Coulomb curve. If you don't apply any force left and right, you get the initial shear strength, which starts on zero. So you 
do a couple of tests, switch a couple of points in order to get a full curve, in order to get out the initial shear strength, in order to get out, if you um, connect the lines, the tangents alpha or the alpha, the angle, to have your shear model. But this is just a picture lab, how it is done. So pretty easy way. In uh, the US and also in Slovenia and parts of Italy, uh, there is still the so-called diagonal tension strength test in order to uh, get out the shear strength. This is a picture copied from the ASTM C1391. Uh, this test is a very, very old test, which is valid for monolithic blocks. If we are talking about um, perforated blocks, where you have a white pattern for clay, for example, as I, s if I showed you before, this method is somehow critically to apply because in this case, you assume the principal forces, you get an, 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 an vertical stress into it or vertical force, you apply the principal forces, um, the sigma 1, sigma 2 and so on, on the, on the Morse uh, circle and get out the shear strength. But as I said, this is only valid and applicable for monolithic blocks like uh, AAC, out-aerated concrete, or calcium silicate blocks. It's not even really applicable for concrete blocks with a void in it, or even not for uh, clay blocks with different white patterns. Uh, from the dynamic, or this is not this is not a dynamic test, but it is an let me say a test to simulate some earthquake uh, behaviors. This is a pushover test or cyclic shear test with uh, a reaction frame. It's always the same way you define a vertical force in order to have a compressive strength, compressive stress in it, a loading which simulates your dead load, your life load, and so on. This kept this will be kept stable. You apply so a so-called stress level, your vertical stress level, and then you have a time history or loading history where you do the cycle three times in each direction, and if the hysteresis is closed, then you go up to the next higher step. So I will show it to you afterwards. It will finish until the full masonry is broken, or 80% uh, normally, we say 80% of the maximum horizontal force is falling down. So this is the most simplest test setup, which is from Croatia. Uh, this is the lab from IGH in Zagreb, where you have a very easy reaction frame, a horizontal jack, which is uh, displacement controlled, and a vertical jack in order to apply your life and dead load, as I said before. The boundary condition in this case, it's a cantilever, so you have fixed at the bottom, and at the top you have a cantilever. Here is the test in reality. Uh, so you apply your vertical force, then apply your cyclic shearings, three, mostly three steps in the same displacement. Um, with the same displacement, then you go up to the next higher displacement step, actually. Here are just some pictures from the instrumentation. In this case, we used LVTDs, just simple LVTDs. Uh, and probably this is also a reason why the tests are mostly stopped at 80% of the maximum shear uh, of the maximum shear force or horizontal force is because we want to save the instruments. This is another lab. This is the lab from uh, Tomasevic in Zak, Slovenia. Also a cantilever, so pretty same setup. You have a reaction frame. This reaction frame looks a little bit different, but it's same the same principle, uh, where you have a horizontal jack displacement controlled and a vertical jack, and also as I said, a cantilever. This is a lab from Italy, a little bit different, but the same principle. Here you apply the vertical loadings with two jacks from left and right. This is from the uh, University of Padua, Professor Modena's lab, is it? Uh, the benefit of having two jacks vertically is that you can control your boundary conditions. I mean, at these times we were doing uh, old cantilever tests, but nowadays there was a research project called ASIC Mase, you can search it on web. It was an FP6 or FP7, so the 6 or 7 European framework with a lot of universities doing it together. Uh, we defined if you have two jacks left and right, you can define a moment middle point where you need it. So you can do it fixed, fixed or cantilever. 
So he's now doing fixed fixed tests as well with the same setup. Here just some live pictures of the test. Uh, this is a setup from Romania, which is a very old setup, which are not used anymore, or, or not, not, not so, this is not so used anymore in common. It's also to simulate a fixed fixed uh, boundary condition for the cyclic shear test. In this case, you have your moment middle point in the middle and not uh, at the top. So to, in order to simulate fixed fixed boundary conditions, you have a parallelogram at the top in order to keep the head of the wall parallel. But uh, as I said, it's a very old or uh, it's an older setup because the problem is we have measured also the displacements here and here, left and right. It is never really 100% parallel. And since it is not parallel, the moment middle point, the zero moment point will move. So you cannot very good simulate a fixed fixed boundary condition. Here are just some pictures of the lab. And this is the most modern setup, which are used by Tomasevic in, in SAC, so in Slovenia, Ljubljana. Also used by the guys from the Rose School in Pavia and uh, Munich, TU Munich from Professor Schermer. So in this case, you use two jacks. Actually, you will see three jacks here. This was only the reason because these two jacks were too, too small. But normally, it's just two jacks. With these two jacks, you control your vertical force. The, vert the sum of the vertical force is always kept constant. But in this case, you control it to have the moment middle point wherever you like it. So you can do the boundary conditions with uh, the moment middle point in the middle, means fixed fixed boundary condition, or you can even have boundary conditions above cantilever. That means that you have the middle point here at the above the wall. So the newest test is right now done in Switzerland by the EPFL Lausanne, Professor Katrin Bayer. She is doing tests with uh, also two jacks controlling the moment, the bending moment, but where you have the moment middle point above the wall in order to see what happens. So here's a picture from the lab from Tomasevic. <coughs> and here just the instrumentation, also LVTDs. The newest test by, uh, there, there are still no, no results out, but next year in the conference she will present some of Katrin Bayer. Uh, she has n first, the first time, as I see, not used any LVTDs, but she has used optical measurements. So she put a spray on the wall and put some cameras in order to see the strains during the test. Um, we as Wienerberger has done most of the tests worldwide. So we have done 140 tests until now on different labs and so on. And all these tests are published if you're interested by a report from the Rose School in Pavia. It's together with uh, Professor Morganes. So this is a collection of all the tests with different boundary conditions and different hysteresis curves and the results for it. So just an interpretation of the results. You have the hysteresis with the closed circles. As I said, three circles each time. Then you go to the next step and try to fit in an envelope in this case and very easy to do a bilinear envelope. If you have the envelope, this is just copy paste from the book from Tomasevich. So said, uh, you end up the test when you reach 80% of H max. That means this is the so-called ultimate displacement. You don't use more than 80% of the uh, maximum horizontal force you could apply on the wall because, as I said, the horizontal tracks are displacement controlled. Uh, then you can define your stiffness, your initial crack uh, displacement, your ultimate displacement, elastic displacement, and so on, in order to calculate your ductility, your mu. And in this case, uh, just as an example, you have the hysteresis, you make the envelope, the bilinearization, you have all the values for the positive side and the negative side, left or right side, to get the ductilities. Um, and since you have the ductilities, we try to estimate the Q values or the R values, the so-called uh, behavior factors, or I think in the US it's called response factors, or response values. This is just an approximation. So it's not a very, very uh, high sophisticated way. But in order to give you an idea what the R values can be, therefore you have two boundary conditions, or we define two boundary conditions. 
to extreme conditions, let me say, in the, say, in, in the first uh, alternative or first variant, you have the elastic displacement, then the plastic displacement at the first floor. Then it goes up with a parallel to the el uh, elastic displacement. So you said that the total displacement at the top can be defined as the mu, the ductility of the structure, is nothing else than the ultimate displacement over the elastic displacement, which is uh, the ductility of the first story. And we take the ductility of the wallet test, of the, sh of the cyclic shear test, as the ductility of the first story, minus 1 over k times n. n is the number of stories. And k is equal to 1 if you have less, than t less or equal to 2 stories. Or if you have more stories, um, k is 2 plus 1. And the second boundary condition is the extreme condition or extreme alternative is if you have, again, uh, the elastic displacement at the bottom plus the plastic displacement, then it goes parallel up. Both alternatives, left and right, are not realistic. Somewhere in the middle is, is the reality. But in order just to have an approximation. approximation. And uh, finally, you can define very easy with the well-known equation for R values or for Q values of behavior factors, response factors, however some codes will call it, by 2 times mu, uh, structure minus 1. This is assuming the equal, uh, the, the equal areas of energy because, as I said, we are very stiff. So we are speaking about frequencies of 3, 5, 6 hertz in masonry buildings. Uh, in the book of Magenes, which has been jointly published with us, uh, we have done lots of tests, as I said, 140 tests, and have defined all the different materials with grinded blocks, with tongue and groove head joints. Grinded blocks are the blocks with the one millimeter mortar just. Uh, mortar pockets in head joints, just tongue and groove with normal bed joints, and so on, fully filled, unfilled, and so on, and has analyzed it due to uh, the first alternative is the left boundary condition I showed before and the right boundary conditions and then took the middle of them in order to have an idea what can the R value, uh, in, in which area the R value is. So we can see that in every case it is higher than 2, 2.5, somewhere around. Magenis then defined in his paper, uh, it was a keynote paper of the European conference in Switzerland, uh, some overstrength factors which is nothing else than if you have a frame as a model, you push the frame. Uh, if you push it to nonlinearity, you have um, plastic hinge. Or in masonry, for sure you have no plastic hinge, but it's a crack in the wall when you get into nonlinearity until you, you reach a kinematic uh, condition where the full structure cracks. So therefore you have an alpha one. Alpha one is the fourth stage where you firstly reach your plastic hinge, and alpha u is the stage where the full system is becoming kinematic. So then he defines two overstrength. Overstrength one is coming from the material safety factors, because in, in Eurocode at least, we're talking about characteristic values. By the way, Eurocode is a semi-probabilistic code like the LRF, LRFD in the US. So we are having uh, 95, 5% fractile values of the of the materials, where it gives you more or less 10% out of it. And then, due to the alpha u over alpha 1, Morganis has defined many, many configurations of uh, ground floor plants. And he defined somewhere around 1.4. But it's depending on your configuration of a ground floor plant, for sure, and also of your section of your, of your structure. Uh, we can assume somewhere an overstrength of 1.5 around. So to the Q values or R values, what I showed before, you can still put the factor of 1.5 on the top of it. The whole thing with overstrength, as I said, is presented in his um, keynote paper from Geneva, the conference in 2006, it was, uh, yeah, 2006, the European conference. Uh, we talked about cyclic shear tests. Now we have also um, reaction wall tests pseudodynamic, pseudodynamic tests on full structures, uh, which we have done. Uh, the one and only uh, lab in Europe is the lab in Italy, <coughs> which is actually not an Italian lab, it's a European lab in Ispra. 
um, where we have done it within the jointly uh, European project ASIC Master, as I said, FP6, a full structure with the numerical model in behind. And here just some impressions of a full scale uh, reaction wall tests, which are also done with masonry. If you want to read something on it, it's on the web page of ASIC Maser. Actually, here. Oops. Yeah, ASIC Maser. It's FP6, the sixth European framework. So, in FP6, in ASIC Maser, you have most of the test results for cyclic shear tests, for reaction uh, wall tests, and some uh, shaking table tests as well from Greece. Talking about shaking table, we have done a couple of shaking table tests which I want to show you. Um, this test is done on a one-story real scale masonry building in, uh, uh, in Macedonia. The resolution is not very good there. So it was a shaking table with two degrees of freedom, both in, in both uh, horizontal axes. <clears throat> mm, it was not very spectacular. The resolution was not very good. But in this case, we tested a two-story building where we have invented a new material uh, which is still not launched on the market, but it is a kind of base isolation, which is not really a base isolation, but you can see that it, that it works. It's a two-story building, which we have tested also in Macedonia. Uh, we tried to move the frequency, like the classical base isolation, uh, out of the plateau range of the response spectra. And it works pretty good, actually. Here you can see that we have put it in this area, and to this uh, joint. It's on the ESIS Institute in Macedonia. <coughs> so we have done four tests there. Um, two on one story, two on two story buildings. Uh, two non-retrofitted, two with the base isolation, and could see that we have really uh, decreased the frequency at the period. <coughs> the problem on all these tests is with masonry, uh, you need the vertical force, you need the vertical loading in order to have the shear strength, as I said before, and uh, or you need some stress in it. So in this case, we have tried it with very, very thin blocks in order to have higher stress in the vertical walls. Uh, and the next problem is that the payloads of the, of the tables are mostly not that high in order to get the realistic uh, vertical compressive uh, uh, stress. So this year we're doing two tests at ELNEC uh, in the FP7 program in Lissabon because Lissabon has a very high payload uh, table where we really want to simulate somewhere around 0.6. This is the normal uh, 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 shear stress level, 0.6 Newton per square millimeter. This is the normal shear uh, vertical stress level. And this is a test we've done in 2005 with an FP5. It was an accident. I don't know if you know this video. It is also in web uh, where a full scale model collapsed. The problem here was, this was in Lissabon where we also do this test this year that uh, it was Friday evening and we wanted to go home and we have uh, tried to increase the, the steps for the AGs for the, for the table a little bit and nothing happened. And finally Alfredo and Emma, the head of the lab said we want to see some cracks with double the intensity each time. So, and the stage before this one, uh, there were not even any cracks. So we doubled it, it was three o'clock in the evening until this happened and finally nobody went home on this day so we all stayed at until nine o'clock in the lab but what you can see here is uh, the classical thing in masonry that you have your soft story in the bottom you have doors normally in the bottom where the stiffness is uh, is decreased in order compared to the upper stories and the collapse is in the first story 
but in masonry you have to really analyze both stories so the, the, the bottom story and the top story because in the bottom story you have mainly upsala you have probably not that high stiffness but you have a higher shear strength due to the higher vertical loadings and sometimes the failure also happens at the upper story because of the fact that you have no vertical force and no shear strength at all although the moment is very less uh, as I said we're speaking about very uh, uh, stiff structures in masonry uh, we identified it by in situ tests so this was a project financed by uh, the Austrian government for a couple of hospitals built with masonry we have applied forced vibration and ambient vibration on the structures uh, forced vibration with a mass exciter which I will show you uh, called Victoria put some accelerometers we have done with accelerometers with laser vibrometers and try to, to match these numbers and also ambient vibration with the more modern sensors very sensitive sensors uh, the problem with ambient uh, vibration tests is that you need a reference point and due to the fact that the structure is very big you need to have one point always fixed on the same place and you need to carry the cables which is quite a lot of work actually <coughs> so this was this is just an example of one structure built with masonry we have uh, put the sensors in the two staircases and also at the top floor we have distributed the sensors and this is the so-called Victoria Victoria is uh, an equipment from AIT Austrian Institute of Technology uh, they developed it uh, in order to test real scale uh, in situ tests with an MTS track so here you have the equipment this is a mass with, with MTS tracks where you can flip uh, to 45 or to any angle you want then you put with a rod with a chain to a window we have fixed it in the window with an I-beam in order to simulate the structure with very less intensity uh, vibrations with uh, the, the benefit or the advantage with force vibration is that you have a transfer function which you don't have when you make an ambient test <coughs> here just some technical data from our uh, exciter so it's a mass exciter it takes place with a rod chain uh, the mass can be flipped to 45 degrees or vertical in order to excite the soil which I will show you later on uh, attainable force uh, with dowel fixing 15 kN you can put some additional mass on the exciter then you can have 25 kN frequency span between uh, 0 to 80 Hz and uh, available piston is uh, 25 centimeters uh, with 0.56 meter per second the velocity and the mass is in total uh, three and a half ton or 3.5 ton here is the in situ measurement for ambient vibration we have used so-called seismic accelerometers very very high sensibility uh, and have filtered out signals from the elevator or stuff like this but it worked pretty well with micro tremors we could also identify the uh, frequency I will show you the, the comparison between these two later on and also with the Victoria with the mass exciter we have excited the soil in order to have an input for the numerical model how to mod mod model the, the soil here are the results of the two tested uh, methods so force and ambient you can see that we have identified almost the same frequency with both methods and the first frequency is around 3 Hz so it is pretty stiff uh, with damping we had some problems because with the damping both methods give us different values so you cannot take it too seriously the damping mo uh, the main information is about the natural frequency the first mode the second mode you can see it's almost in the same in the third mode we couldn't even identify any uh, vibration or modes in with the fourth method whereas with the fourth mode we could only identify it with the fourth method and the fifth mode we could identify with both methods but however the most important modes are these two modes and you can see clearly this is the first mode and the second mode is really with, with uh, one knot in the middle <coughs> 
the numerical anal analysis has been done with an, uh, ANSYS, where we have implemented the material model, what I've shown you before, the three-dimensional one, and this layer here in red and in green simulates the soil with the properties we got out of the soil tests. And this is just another hospital, what we have done. So we have done a model update from the numerical model to the measured ones, and uh, this is another uh, structure, and have, have had it very close with the calculator frequency to the uh, no, analysis frequency to the measured one frequency. The result of the whole thing was just in order to see which parts should be rearranged, which parts of the hospital should be strengthened or retrofitted. In this case, they have put the, the surgery rooms, uh, the surgery rooms were in a higher endangered uh, area. They have replaced, uh, re removed the surgery rooms to another part. Uh, finally, some general rules. These pictures are stolen from Professor Tomasevich, as are not my pictures, but it gives a pretty good idea what can happen with masonry and earthquake. So uh, one main issue is the out-of-plane issue. These are real pictures from Macedonia. And uh, yeah, I think it was Macedonia. <coughs> Here, if you don't connect these two corners with, with some, some beams at the top, the out-of-plane wallet can fall down. Just some general rules. Well, here you can see this also out-of-plane problem. Here the front wallet wanted to move out due to the fact this is a natural stone. There's no connection between the shear wall in this direction and the shear wall in this direction. And uh, shear failures, in this case, classical shear failures, these are uh, pictures from Switzerland. Shear failures in masonry are classically done with an X white, uh, with an X break pattern. <coughs> and finally, just some uh, summing ups. The out of plane can be avoided if you fix the corners between the one wall and the orthogonal wall to it, or if you put a beam on the top of it, or if you use confined masonry for seismic areas. Uh, and yeah, the same like before. And some other hinds, uh, this is the same effect like the short column effect also applies for walls, as you know, and also for long walls. There are some rules also given in the code uh, what the maximum distance should be between uh, two walls when you have a wall orthogonal to it. So I think we're coming to the end, yeah. Thank you very much. That was great, thanks very much. So we have time for a few questions from the audience. Uh, um, you showed us briefly some of, some of these Q factors, R factors for, mm -hmm. and for these different basic uh, configurations. So what's the process you go through if you have a, a new product that you're producing in there or um, kind of one of these new uh, configurations? Can you get a, a specific Q factor for, for your products or, or do you have to do that on a project by project basis to deviate from like a Euro code? Uh, how, how does that work? I mean, it, it depends. First of all, we have done, as I said, most of the tests. So we have put our input to the publicity uh, for the existing products in order to uh, give some modifications into the Eurocode. Now the Eurocode will be modified for the existing products. And for new products like the polyurethane glue, uh, which is out of the scope of any codes, we have, re we have to do all the tests and can define an own Q factor. But in this case, if we define an own Q factor as a company, I'm speaking, the responsibility is also on the company. That means we can define whatever we want. We get an European technical approval or American technical approval, depending on where we place this product. But if it's out of the scope of any codes, the full responsibility in case of an, an failure in real earthquakes is on our place. How many Q factors are there for the existing products? The for existing products? Uh, now in, in codes, uh, we have now, I mean, we have also jointly done it with other producers. We are only doing clay, but other companies are doing auto-aerated concrete, or different companies are doing uh, kinds of silicate. So 
we have done Q factors actually not too many for each product one Q factor and in our case for different uh, white uh, for different white patterns uh, just sum it up with uh, the white ratio so we have not really defined every white pattern because we're inventing a real, uh, some white pattern every year with white ratio that means how many percentage of white you have in case to the a clay and also uh, Q values for uh, for head joints we defined. So these are in codes, but it depending on the country, because for example in Europe you have a general Euro code and each country has a national defined parameter, so national annex. In some countries they are saying we want to have just one Q value overall, and some countries are saying we want to have it very, very fine defined for every product. It is pretty high, as we know, but uh, this is just the experimental Q value. You also need to take in mind that the Q value is always depending on the vertical load you applied for the test, because as higher the vertical load is, or that the vertical stress, as more fragile the wall is, or as less ductility the wall is. So these are just experimental values. In codes, in general, for unreinforced masonry, you have values in, in, in Europe somewhere around two, just in Italy. Uh, in the ordinance, Magenus has defined the OSR, as I said, the overstring factor with somewhere around 1.4 to 1.5. You can have up to three. But this is just, I uh, cannot find the slightest one slide before. Uh, this is just experimental values in order to show what is possible with masonry. For sure, if it's applied in a code, it's much more conservative. Another question about these, uh, mm. these base isolation systems mm -hmm. that's very fast. It's very interesting. I've never seen that before. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Like, what's the, what is the material? Yeah, it is actually still in research. We have not launched this product. Uh, the material is a recycled material from tires, rubber tires. Uh, we found a producer, which is not us, but, but some, another company who can have with a special glue and rubber tires produced a mat with always the same properties with constant properties, which is very needed for us. So we have done cyclic shear tests with it. We have done shaking table tests, as I said before. It works. The problem why we have not launched it on the market is due to practical reasons, because normally if you have a wall, you plaster the wall. And if you plaster the wall also at the bottom, you have always micro tremors or some settlements due to vertical force because you have some, something in the rubber, the elastic thing, it goes down, it creates cracks in the plaster. This is a problem which we have not solved until now. We are looking for a solution. Uh, that's more or less the only reason why we haven't launched it, yeah. There's no problem with like, mechanical equipment or anything? Uh, is there problems with like, mechanical equipment or other? Um, uh, mechanical equipment, no, no, because we always only have it in bearing walls and said that, uh, let me say, water pipes and so on are not going through the walls in this case. What we are not sure is if we will put the base isolation, it's not a base isolation actually, we have called it base insulation internally, but however, uh, we have not decided if we will put it into every story or only at the bottom story actually. Yes, yes, it decreases the load capacity, the vertical load capacity, uh, depending on the thickness you use. We have used five centimeter uh, stripes. We have also used three centimeter stripes to do compressive tests. It decreases the, the vertical loading also. But um, normally we don't use the vertical, or we don't need the vertical stress strength at all, because as I said, we are using a wall with normally 0.6, 0.9 megapascal newton per square millimeter, and the strength of such a wall is around 5 to 6. So you have a buckling factor into it, let me say 2, 2.5, then you still have 2. And you just need 0.9, so you still have a reserve of the double of it, therefore it should be all right, yeah. And so it's, it's less than a factor of 2 reduction in the... Yeah, yeah, yeah.
I'll explain that. I'm curious about this. Um, in the, in the, you showed a, a lot of these uh, laboratory tests of kind of subsections of walls and, and kind of uh, results there. Uh, I've seen a few of those tests, but I'm curious to ask you about it. I assume there's a size effect, and you have to get to some, some uh, minimum size of a wall before you get the kind of system effect. Uh, how do you evaluate how big of a specimen you need in order to be? Um, we are doing it always with real scale uh, blocks, so we never scale the blocks. Uh, in our case, it's also a practical case because clay blocks are produced by an extruder, and uh, you define from clay blocks the vertical compressive strength of the block, the horizontal compressive strength of the block, the white ratio. Um, and it's hard to scale it from the production point of view, so therefore we have always real scale blocks, therefore we don't have any, any scale effects. The only thing is, uh, what is still not defined, because this is still a, a topic which is open in the project ASIC Mase, is um, if you should do the test on a uh, height of 1 meter 40 or 1 meter 50, that means 5, 6 courses, or 2 meter 50, full story height. So this is something which is not defined. Uh, there is an agreement to say if you do cantilever tests, uh, you can do it on a high height because the moment is the same. But if you do a fixed, fixed-ended test, you can do it, you should do it on a full uh, height wall because of the fact that the moment is still the same again. But as I said, uh, Katrin Bayer from EPFL Lausanne, Switzerland, is now firstly doing tests in order to see if these assumptions are okay or not, because she will fix the moments near, uh, moment zero point above the wall. So imaginary above the wall, she's not doing cantilever, but even more than cantilever, which is interesting, and she will publish it, I think, on a conference next year. Oh, no, sorry, this year in Lisbon, this year in Lisbon, yeah. So sorry, I cannot hear. Your model has no slack, right? No slabs. No slabs. Ah, for the for the cyclic shear test, I mean. Yeah, I haven't described it. You are right. There are no slabs, but But you have always at the top a very, very stiff beam which simulates a slab. So you have, on the, you have a footing which is made of reinforced concrete and also at the top in order to uh, transfer the vertical load into the wall. So this is always a very stiff beam in order to simulate the slab. Ah, actually, you mean of the compressive, uh, compressive stress. This doesn't matter because we control the compressive stress in the wallet by the jacks. So you just need to have something stiff in order to transfer it to the wall. The vertical loading are applied by the vertical jacks anyway. So you control it by the vertical jacks, so keep it constant. It cannot, be, it cannot alter during the test. And this gives you the simulation of uh, life loads and dead loads and whatever. The only thing what we have not tested here, which has been tested, um, I think there are still no papers out in Munich, is uh, what happens if a wall, if you have a T-section or an I-section of a wall. Here you need a slab in order to see how the shear forces will transfer out from the let me say shear wall to the flanges. Actually, here you need a slab. They have done it in in, in Munich. They've done cyclic shear tests and pseudodynamic tests with an American model in behind uh, on a reaction frame. Here you need a slab to see how much of the shear stress can be transformed uh, or can be transferred from the slab to the other uh, to the other wall. This is the only case. But if you purely test wallets, some walls in this case you don't need really a slab. You just need a stiff thing, and you have the simulation of the vertical forces with the jacks. The rotation is measured, so you have we've instrumented the wall in order to measure the rotation. We also, uh, in this case, yeah, we've also put an LVTD. Normally, 
at the bottom and at the, at the front face of the wall in order to see how is the rotation of the wall. This is also necessary if you make the fix-fix tests to see if the wall is still parallel at the top. If you make some cantilever tests, sure, the whole thing will rotate, yeah. But if you make a, a fix-fix test, you put uh, LVTTs on the top of it to see if the wall is still parallel at the top. The force is not eccentric. The force is not. In in this case, I mean, in this case, the force is. Uh, you have two jacks, although here you have here the schematic. Here we're speaking about two jacks actually, although you have three jacks, but this was only the case because the one jack was too weak in the lab. So we've done it with more or less two jacks. And with these two jacks, we controlled it in order to have uh, the moment middle point in the middle or whatever you wanted to have on the boundary conditions. So the condition was uh, check the rotation at the top by the two jacks, and also that the sum of the two jacks the, the, the sum of the forces of the applied of the applied force of the two jacks are kept constant in order to have the same uh, vertical stress in the world all the time. But this was the conditions. And if you have, let me show you this again. This is the Romanian, this is the Italian. The very simple setup here. You have only one jack in the middle, but. Uh, these tests are not so quite often done anymore, but anyhow, you have just one test in the, uh, one check in the middle, and this is also still centric. And still you have also the, the head rotation controlled and also measured in, in, in the report in this case here. So does it, I'm not sure if it answers your question, because I'm not sure if you're happy now. <coughs> Maybe we can chat about it a little bit. Then. All right. Anything else from uh, one last question? Well, actually, about the cyclic test that you, uh, well, the shake table test that you conducted, how correct or wrong is it to subject to uh, sequentially increasing uh, mag uh, uh, magnitude of uh, shake uh, ground history uh, time histories? Because pro probably after the first few times you conducted, you may have induced some sort of micro cracking or some sort of fatigue in the in the structure, which would probably increase the probable collapse as you keep increasing it up. So, how can you say that exactly when I've been subjected to so and so magnitude of earthquake that that's the one that's probably collapse? I mean, you're totally right. Uh, this is the dilemma with shaking table test that we don't apply at the first moment, uh, at, at the first step, the full acceleration we wanted to have. We, we increasingly are coming closer to the point what we want to have. Uh, what we are doing is also after each step, which is always normal, doing either some random vibration or some sign sweep, not sign sweep, sign sweep is too dangerous, but some random vibration in order to get out the first frequency again to see if there's a swift. Swift, there's always a swift after each step. As you said, due to cracks, the full thing is becoming uh, softer. This is a major dilemma of these tests, I know. Uh, although in codes, are written also in, in, in the FEMA if you, uh, when I remember correctly, if you do an evaluation or assessment of an existing building, uh, you should, if you don't if you have no more information, you should calculate the first natural frequency and then take the half of it for an existing building in order to say after the years of, of, of erection and so on due to some settlements, micro tremors, whatever, the walls had some micro cracks in, in it already. So this gives a little bit more uh, positive side, but you're totally right. It, it is the big dilemma that we cannot put a uh, structure on the table and then excite it with the real earthquake. It's, we're not doing it normally. There is also one funny story uh, because the, 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 the houses or the models are built not on the table but beside of the table. And you have to transport it from the uh, place of erection to the table. And uh, there is also one paper published by Alfredo Campos Costa and Emma Coelho from Lissabon. 
where they have done it, I think it was eight, nine years ago. Um, they have, after they uh, after they have, uh, make the model beside the table, they have identified the first frequencies, and after the transportation, already the frequency dropped by half. So uh, due to the transportation process, and therefore they could not use the model at all. But normally we try to have a very stiff footing. This is calculated in before to have an, an ambient vibration with a hammer or whatever to see what is the first frequency. Put it on the table, check it again. If it's all right, then we start the test with the dilemma as you described totally correctly. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much for it. Thank you.